start by asking a quick question. Uh, and if I ask you the question, you'll see that it's got a pretty obvious response. If I ask you if you want the world to look the same all over, in every country, or even in half the countries in the world, same topography, same buildings, same food, maybe different names, but the same substance. If I ask you if that's what you wanted in 50 to 100 years, you would tell me that's not what you want. Every politician would say the same thing. Every scientist would presumably say the same thing as well. Even though science is something that people probably believe is you know, more universal than building codes and a lot of other issues like you know just changing geography. So there's something within us that values diversity. We don't know why. But when it's presented in a certain way, in a very abstract way, almost all of us would say that we value it. Let me try another question. If I ask you, if you want, as a politician, if you want to have more money coming into your country, more investments, especially from a country that has a, tra a good track record in creating bridges, dams, apparel companies, and so on. Um, technology, you would, that you and the most politicians would say yes. So you have two abstract questions, and the answer to both are diametrically opposed. If you say yes to one, the other answer becomes, becomes the opposite of what you intend. Simply because the minute you accept foreign direct investment from a country that's stronger than you are financially and more developed in where it is on the technological scale, chances are you're going to get the same designs as part of that direct investment, even though overall all the numbers will show that your country is doing better. And it may very well be the case, but as you can see, number one, the way that we think and the way we answer questions is often based on how we're presented with the question and also what level of informational access we receive. Let's try something else. I ask, do you, do you support a system where local education efforts from primary and secondary school would result long term in a fragmented educational system of knowledge that is different based on your zip code. You say, that doesn't sound like a good idea. Now I happen to support competition in education. I happen to support the idea that people in different zip codes ought to be able to jump into other zip codes and get a different education if they want. But I also acknowledge that the consequences of that include a more fragmented system where the older systems that are not performing essentially lose momentum. And usually when things and ideas and people lose momentum, the end result is extinction. That's another reason why you know, as human beings, we oftentimes succeed if we just simply move. Um, you can see how, once again, you can look at it the other way as well, because the way you present a question and the way you answer the question a lot of times depends on having informational access, which is also fragmented all over, all over the world. So, in a way, you can see that informational integrity is extremely important. You can also see that under those circumstances, within my answer, that I, do, that I prefer not to have a long-term fragmented education system, you can also see that you can probably presume or legislate ways of creating a standardized education system for the very basics and then having systems in place that allow people to maximize their talents uh, based on whatever specific area they want to go into. Um, so in other words, if you're really good at music, maybe you don't need to be studying advanced physics uh, in high school. Um, you can also see a lot of other permutations of the same issue. And you can see how I flipped it in the sense that I started off with something general that most people would, almost everyone would say, uh, would disagree with, but I'm also able to 
switch it around and say, you know, on the other side, and say something like, well, do you want your child to be restricted in terms of educational opportunities based on his or her zip code? If your child is in a district that has had an underperforming school for the last 15 years. Once again, that doesn't sound like a good idea. But you can see how your answer to these questions, regardless of what your own ideology is, shifts based on the execution and the actual facts on the ground relating to you specifically. That's why you can also now understand that informational access and integrity, in other words, the, um, the signal on the information noise and how well it accurately reflects what's actually out there. You can see that if it becomes distorted, it affects the answers, not only the answers, but your ability to even ask and contemplate and create the right questions. So, this, that's part one. Part two is it appears in 2019 that despite having more progress on paper than ever before, we have progressed in most ways in philosophy. The easiest example of that would be we used to believe, a co very common, that it, it is better that one criminal go free, or a hundred criminals actually go free, if it means that one innocent man or woman would not be in jail unjustly. The idea behind all this, of course, pretty straightforward. You have to have a system that places checks and balances and restrictions on what the police can do or what the executive branch can do and the police are merely extensions of the executive branch the action branch you can see that having those restrictions oftentimes means that you will have to allow criminals to go free simply because of a lot of different factors what was what's happened in 2019 has been happening for a long time since the 1970s is that and that's why when you watch movies about war and, and a lot of other things in the, uh, that, that address the 20th century um, and the 21st, a lot of it is just based on information and misinformation. Um, you hear about surveillance, you hear about, um, you know, one example that comes up is East Germany. You hear about secret forces like the Stasi. Everyone's got them. Some people do a better job of hiding them than others. But you can see how the whole idea behind having intelligence and counterintelligence. The whole idea is to try to create a better signal that catches more and more information. But what's happened over time is that we've actually flipped the script. Today, if we want to be honest with ourselves, the system now has gone completely in the other direction. It's now, it now believes, based on the execution that we're seeing everywhere, based on surveillance, based on technology, based on the checks and balances that are supposed to operate within the executive branch, we can now see that ultimately, we now believe, based on our actions and our non-actions, it is better for one innocent man to be in jail than it is to let one innocent person, or one criminal go free. It is better today, based on our systems, to let an innocent man or woman stay in jail or to be arrested than it is to allow a criminal the opportunity to go free. Technology has made that happen. So right away you can see that there are always different timelines. And so we are now in a timeline that because of its unrestricted unrestricted technological surveillance capacity, we are now in a time where we, can, we, we have made the other side possible. So, ultimately, the question is whether we can make a U-turn, and if so, how? Because the timeline that we're on now is not, not an ideal timeline, and I'll tell you why. We already established that in the abstract, human being, human, no, there's something within humanity that likes diversity. Um, but there's also something else. You know, 
we all we all pretty much recognize most of us do that one of the problems with having a security state that has the capacity to avoid checks and balances thereby ensuring the capture of every criminal in the world is, is highly problematic simply because you're still relying on human judgment the human judgment factor doesn't go away it's merely the, the ability to reverse through a separate system usually within the judicial branch to reverse the mistakes made by the executive branch and all of these sectors depend on credibility so what they've discovered over time is if they can censor critics they're able to have more credibility and they're able to get things done faster and more efficiently thereby increasing their credibility no matter how good you are if you cost too much money chances are um, that people will try to find a workaround. What's happened now has been an incredible sort of shift from that original idea where checks and balances were presumed necessary, not only to ensure that people's speech would not be chilled, but also to create a system where all timelines, all potential timelines are preserved. By that I mean if we have a system where everything we do, where all the criminals are able to be put in jail, and because te technology has, allows us now to do that, what we recognize, because we also value diversity, is that for the most part, creativity goes away or is reduced. It doesn't actually go away. There were movies made during the Third Reich, um, some of them apparently quite good. Um, there were movies made when uh, slavery was still something that was acceptable in the US. Some of them appear to be quite good in advance for their time. Um, even through the 1960s, we had uh, in an Audrey Hepburn movie, Breakfast at Tiffany's, a caricature of an Asian um, character, a landlord, that just makes absolutely no sense to anyone who's traveled in 2019. Um, so you can see once again, these timelines Right, don't necessarily stifle creativity, but they create reduced numbers of, of opportunities for certain timelines to exist. So suddenly, a movie that the executive branch, which is now exempt from checks and balances for the most part, except for the occasional sort of show of putting somebody in jail um, or prosecuting somebody within their own ranks, because again, that judicial branch is sort of, you know, it's always on the outside. Um, because it's not going to be on the ground floor in the same way that the, executive, that the executive branch is. So we can see all of that, where the executive branch over the last 15, 50 years has used um, the, the banks and debt and bonds in order to make it appear, in order to convince politicians and voters that if you provide us more money and more access and more discretion, what will happen over time is that we will have a safer society and economic growth will continue faster than before because we've put all the criminals in jail and because we've done that ultimately uh, we will have more jobs and things will be just peachy you see that's actually not the case for everything but there's a new invention there's always a flip side to it whether it's nuclear energy or the internet so the point that i'm trying to make is that not only does this flip in philosophy between the executive and the legal branches, does, not only does it, does it represent a loss of creativity by reducing the number of timelines that are available to us through chilled speech, in other words, people themselves simply decide that, well, I don't really want to stick my neck out against the uh, president. Um, I might as well just put my head down and, you know, maintain my shop and deal with my customers. Uh, and in doing so, the world, because now things really aren't local, um, they don't have to be, right, um, as much anymore. Um, you have to publish a book in the, in the old days, you had to have access to a printing press. Now, you go online, something allows you, a new piece of technology allows you to have the access to the whole world. But the idea behind this, right, is that you know, if you do chill speech, if you do end up simply going about matters of business, you don't end up in a position where we're able to maximize all the different ideas in the world and try to get the best out of them. Uh, and oftentimes, 
human beings work on what, ha what has happened before and what they're exposed to before. So somebody who listens to Billie Jean, Michael Jackson's Billie Jean, may have an entirely different timeline um, than somebody else who never experiences that beat. In the same way, somebody who reads Malcolm X speaks in the, in the U.S. may have a completely different timeline in terms of his or her ideas than somebody who is never exposed to that book simply because of either censorship or other ways of suppressing that those kinds of ideas that may not be favorable to the, to the executive branch. So, number one, creativity, creativity does not necessarily, necessarily go away in a security state. If anything, it may increase because the security state will also rely, like everything else, on marketing, aka propaganda, in order to maintain its legitimacy. The danger is that the timelines change simply because you have fewer of them as the signal decreases or becomes corrupted with respect to the available amount of information around you. The world has now changed now to the point where information no longer has to be local, but it can now be accessed all over the world and vice versa. The signal has to be stronger, but it hasn't worked out that way. So one of the issues that, that's very important to understand about this, these ideas is that when the timelines change, one of the problems with having a security state where the executive branch is able to, through technology, suppress, repress, or favor certain timelines and certain books and certain ideas over others. This is now made quite easy because of digital, um, just, just technology, changing from analog, physical, to something that's less physical. So you can see how the timelines change in ways that become self-reinforcing. So in an ideal world, right, we have options of having, let's just go with a million different doors, a million different sliding doors, a million different timelines. The greater the executive branch, the greater the power of the surveillance state that sucks away or that creates an imbalance between the other branches, the journalism branch, that fourth pillar, in, in New York Times versus Sullivan, um, the judicial branch and the legal branch, the more any one of those branches becomes, any one of those pillars becomes imbalanced. What you're doing is you're removing forever different timelines. You're reducing the number of timelines. The difference is that it's much harder for the, the judicial branch, which may bankrupt you or may can take up your time, to completely eliminate timelines because again, they're not like the executive branch. They're not, they're not on the ground floor. They don't have the power to arrest you. They don't have the power to order, perhaps. Um, but, you know, they can sanction. But ultimately, there are ways that you can bypass, if you really, really wanted to, the judicial branch. Even the legislative branch, because of the way that laws can be interpreted differently, uh, certainly by the time it's a law is made, five years down the road, you know, that same law may either be useless or the facts on the ground have changed, uh, where ultimately, you know, the laws are no longer applicable or ideal. So you can still try to get around them, and perhaps the judicial branch, depending on who's there, um, just even just by, you know, may actually make it easier to do a bypass or a mitigation that doesn't eliminate entirely one of those million timelines. But you can also see, and, and by the way, just the fact that you get a random judge assigned to you when you file a case, um, in and of itself, it makes it harder to eliminate timelines in humanity's existence. So, the problem with the executive branch, because, because of its ability to exist forever, in perpetuity through debt, that again self-reinforces itself over time, and also with technology, that oftentimes is limited and restricted only to the executive branch and no one else. You can see how the bigger the executive branch gets in the sense of, of security and surveillance, the more you not only eliminate timelines, the more you get closer to armed violence <clears throat> and in many cases uh, genocide in order to continue the status quo. Um, the reason being, again, is only one of these branches has the power to arrest, to jail, and in the process of doing these things, put themselves at, sometimes, at great risk. 
because it's not just them that has technology and you don't need to have a semi machine gun um, in order to you know to, in order to cause damage uh, to someone else even if that person has a bazooka if you have a pistol or a knife sometimes it's just as good depending on the circumstances so argument remember is a mimicking of the original argument made is that ultimately we want people that are in charge of the executive branch to be able to interpret things as freely as possible in their duties in order to protect the public based on the on the information they have the problem with that obviously is that we're still dealing with human, human beings so human beings have biases they don't have necessarily the same signal or even a good one um, and it used to be that that signal we recognized all these limitations of the executive branch so what we did was we said you know, it was a good idea for a police officer to be in a to live in the same neighborhood and they go to the same schools as everyone else as opposed to putting their, his or her child in a private school where they're not necessarily exposed to the community um, as much we used to have these sort of informal mechanisms in place that have again gone away because of the same thing we talked about earlier where we're trying to eliminate randomness where, and in doing so unintentionally change our own timelines by eliminating possibilities of jumping between them between those million different options. And so and with the, one of the things that we've accepted in 2019 is simply that because technology is now more widespread, you get into these debates about who should have technology. Let's just, and we can just switch it to make it something that's e more easier to grasp, which is guns. You know, who should have guns? How do we restrict the guns? A lot of that goes back again into this overarching picture of how do we make it so that the, that the executive branch is able to do its job better and more safely overall and so a lot of these debates all circle back to a central government or a local government's desire to create not just control but stability while also ideally uh not suppressing ideas and creativity so but you can see again how over time we just talked about in the first part how even asking the right you know just even asking a question even if you have good intentions, chances are, if that informational signal on the ground floor is not 100% accurate, and it never is, it just never is, um, what happens is that you're going to have different outcomes, your best of, your best of intentions may actually, may actually result in a, the exact opposite scenario that you intended. So, the question we, we're in, the question we have now Hopefully, we can recognize that these timelines, you know, if you have a million timelines and you go down to 50, you know, you've lost out on time, but it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, go back to a million. It's just going to take a lot of time, uh, a lot more time, and ultimately, the question is, how do you do that? We have to get there by understanding that, ultimately, a lot of these questions that we're asking a lot of them are designed so that the abstracts, things like technology, they're designed so that they're supposed to be designed so that we can access the physical parts of our lives more conveniently. That's actually the, the whole basis behind IoT. Uh, the whole basis behind the Internet of Things is I walk into my house, my house with my servant, everywhere. Whether it's a refrigerator, um, whether it's a shopping list, all of it becomes automatic. But we're sort of missing the point because what you're really supposed to do, the technology, is make it easier for the farmer, make it easier for people who deliver and make things to reduce mistakes, like on bridges, like in medical care, like healthcare. You know, do you want, you know, with things where machines are clearly able to do a, at least a better job initially than human beings. So our, our solution, by the way, in 2019 uh, has been because human discretion has failed so many times because, because of that innate, innate bias, it's not innate, actually. It's um, something that's formed over time based on your own signal uh, and the strength of the signal and its ability to access different scenarios over time as you grow up. What we've done is we said, well, we've got computers and chips and technology and AI. Uh, you can make a signal that covers all the information in the whole world. So we're going to replace slowly human discretion and create, in doing so, what's going to happen, of course, is that the executive branch continues to get bigger and bigger in all areas, not just in security and surveillance. And, and 
so that's when, again, that, that's what worries me, is that over time, you can see all these timelines being reduced in an effort to create something that most people would believe, right, is a good thing for society and for safety and for, and for everyone involved. Just like that first question we asked, you, know, you don't want the world to look the same, um, but you also want investment. So you can see that how we do something, how we execute something is just as important as why we do something and, and ultimately how we fund it. So what's really happening here is that we have to get back to a point where we understand the technology is the most honest the ability of all of us to be able to increase the timelines rather than reduce them. One of the ways we do that is by making sure that all these things that we came up with that were organic in nature, for example, we, we, we came up with public schools. We didn't do it, right? Our ancestors did. Everywhere. The whole point of that was to create a way for people to come together within a community, whether they were a baker, a barber, um, or a mechanic, or a butcher, or a lawyer, or a future lawyer. Yet, the whole idea behind that was to increase the, signal, the accuracy of the signal strength within that local box, within that local other world. So, you can see right, right away that that was an organic way of doing what we're trying to do now. In other words, we're trying to feed information from all over the world into one little box and then try to have it give us the best solution, the best path. <clears throat> But again, we had all these things before in the physical world, but we shouldn't realize that that's why we're doing things like coming up with public things, um, like education. We still kind of realize it. That's one reason why some people are against privatization, even though that would, again, you know, lock in some people into unfavorable outcomes. That's why we talk about utilitarianism so much. But again, these are all abstract issues. The reality of the situation is that how you do, how you implement something, regardless of the answer to your questions on any issue, is the key deciding factor. The problem we have now today is that the way that we're implementing and executing whatever it is we're trying to fix is going to be a scenario where we guarantee fewer timelines all over the world and sameness all over the world. It doesn't have to be that way. The question is, how do you fix it? We have to get back. And we've already, we already know this, right? We already know that the local tends to work better um, than the national and the global. That's why we're so uh, enamored with this deglobalization that's happening right now, even though, you know, you can also argue it the other way, right? If you're a country that doesn't have, that has coal, but not natural gas, <clears throat> you can actually, you know, obviously you're better off with globalization because you have a set price for natural gas somewhere. Um, you know, you've got shipping costs that are go down if you have competition. Um, and so, you know, you're able to jump, leapfrog a polluted situation that would essentially affect the whole world, not just your country. Because, you know, it's not as if pollution stays in one place, it typically can go in other places, depending on the severity of it. So, you can see right away, you, you can see right away you can be against globalization, um, while still understanding that in some ways and in some areas, it is it would be the perfect solution. And that actually goes back to another issue is, how do we share things and innovation? Because we know that deep down, deep down we know that a lot of who we are is based on a signal in a box. Which is our brain. It's based on a signal in a box, right? It is only able to be exposed to so much for most of us. So ultimately the idea behind globalization is that we try to increase the size of that box. And then, now we've realized that maybe it's getting a little bit too difficult. But it's not because the task, the task has always been the same. Whether you're out in the tundra or the jungle somewhere, um, it's always been the same. I think, and this is what really troubles me, is that our humility in understanding the task at hand and how difficult it is to maintain those million timelines uh, has gone away for somehow um, in favor of something else, and I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's not temptation, we've always had that. It's not convenience, we've always wanted that. It does feel as if something's changed, and I think what I'm feeling is the elimination of many, many timelines. And the reason that that original scenario, that original philosophical truism, truism, truism held so much weight back in the day, and it no longer does today, based on what we see, 
it's because of what we see. In the old days, you could believe in the abstract. It is better to let one to let ten criminals go free than to let an, an innocent person go to jail. We were able to, to, to that made more sense to us because we didn't necessarily have as much television. We didn't have shows like you know that they were glorified police officers or that maligned criminals so badly. Because we never had those shows, our informational access was geared towards the abstract. Partly because we were not yet in a picture-based society. So we were going by the visual, we were going by our brains, that signal box, based on what we saw for the most part, and a very limited but tailored informational box uh, that did prioritize, prioritize the abstract over the visual. In other words, the brain over the eyes. As the television moved in, suddenly, if I'm able to see somebody die right in front of me, uh, I'm able to see the grieving mother and the family, suddenly it doesn't look so good as good. Uh, if, I, if I'm able to see that all the time, by the way, um, based on the executive branch's ability to influence the media based on marketing and propaganda, I'm able to, if I'm able to see that all the time, suddenly my signal is, ex is corrupted. It's gone from the abstract and all these unknown possibilities, all these unknown timelines that are preserved that you don't see, that's what you're preserving when you agree to that philosophical foundation. It is better to have checks and balances than it is to have a totalitarian surveillance state. You agree to that because you want to preserve as many timelines as you possibly can, despite knowing that some timelines get snuffed out immediately, which you don't want, which is what the focus has to be, is how do you eliminate and reduce the ability of some people that don't necessarily want to be peaceful, how do you reduce the exposure effect where people build on things that come before them, you know, which is why it's so important to have as much access to good information as you possibly can, uh, as well as the ability to distinguish between false and true, and true information. The whole idea is that the, we're trying to create a scenario where we preserve all these timelines while at the same time maximizing both the ability to deal with these problems at the organic level. Whereas today, because we've moved into a visual society and we are increasingly moving into a video-based society now, not just a photo-based society, what's going to happen is we're going to eliminate almost entirely the brain and move over to the eyes. And that's why we're here today, is because just photos, photo, you know, photographs by themselves, um, you know, a picture is worth you know a thousand words. Um, what's going to happen is those thousand words won't you know really be available anymore because what's going to happen over time will be. I'm trying to figure out a way to explain this. It is much easier to believe in the idea of checks and balances if you don't see the one one to two to three percent of times when it goes badly and we're, when you're unable to in some ways when you're unable to empathize with the loss of somebody else um, who is suffering a very real consequence but one that is in most cases uh, you know less risky than what our eyes would tell us our eyes lie to us all the time it's our brain that we rely upon to interpret the images coming in and into that signal box What's happening now is that you can imagine, this is a key point that I've been trying to make this whole time. You can believe in that original hypothesis, that, that original philosophy of checks and balances based on an innocent man being in jail because it's the abstract. But if I show you all these photos all the time, all these videos of people, of criminals being going free and then committing further violations, um, you're suddenly going to have a harder time having the images come in you're going to have a harder time maintaining signal integrity. The images will come in, they will corrupt the signal, the ability of your brain to interpret them properly within context. And that's what's happened today. That's why we've moved into this situation where we've flipped the other way around. It's a logical result of moving from words that we interpret using our brains that are not attached to photos to suddenly having information overload without the context necessary to interpret all these different pictures. We've moved into that 
we moved from that into video, now suddenly we're looking at a scenario where it's not just, um, where we're able to tailor the information coming into our box, which is maybe just, just as bad as getting biased information or information that's paid to be presented to you based on whatever lobby is in place at a certain point in time or at a certain location. So you can see very clearly why we are in the way, in this position, because we've, the idea ultimately is that it's always important to realize that the integrity of the signal, of the signal box, of the signal and the box that receives that information is fragile. It can be corrupted so easily. So we used to say, that's why we used to have philosophy, that's why we used to have debates, you know, the good ones, not just sound bites. We were trying to get as much information as we possibly can, and that's what leadership was supposed to represent, the idea that we want to maintain that signal by creating organic methods on the ground that will assist the executive branch, whoever it is, it could be social workers, you know, um, not, just, not just on the security side, lots of people do things. The idea is using that technology that abstracts things, things you can't see, to make it easier for, you know, to, to eliminate famines, to get efficient resources, things to where they need to be, to, to characterize cancer faster and better. All these things were starting to get there, but it's, it's a situation where we have to get there soon, because if we don't, we've got all these timelines that are based on the video and the visual. And that's what's led to a callousing of the signal of just the human heart, although it's really the human brain, because of these constant images that now make it harder to argue for anyone to argue in favor of sex imbalances when confronted with an image of something somebody will show you on television or a video or a photo that says, had you put this man in jail, had you not had any sex imbalances, had you let this police officer do their job in any way they deem fit, my son was still here today, or my daughter would be here today, or my mother would be here today. But you have to remember the idea of having a brain is so that we can refute that. It's become much much harder to refute it, but we have to rely on our brains because they will have always they will have better context than any machine. Because what I just tried to explain is that if you live it up to the machines, they will create a self-reinforcing reality that limits all the available timelines. Whereas the human brain we like diversity, deep down, fundamentally. We don't want to eliminate timelines. We do it when we have a box that is corrupted, that corrupts the signal, you know, getting out, you know, getting out. So, we have to remember that the way to debate that is simply, you know, ma'am, you know, this is a horrible thing, it's a tragedy, and we need to fix the problem uh, so that it doesn't happen again. We can't fix it by violating what is fundamental about human nature, uh, by violating freedom, by allowing a security state to essentially eliminate possibilities for all of us. What we must do is we must determine what was the root cause. It probably isn't something as simple as poverty. It's probably a thousand different things. It's probably, um, you know, maybe even a million different things. And our task at hand is to try to figure out what is going on that caused this person to commit violence and then fix that problem. Whereas trying, rather than trying to deal with the result, which is what you're asking me to do as a politician, as a human being, as a father, as a citizen, or a politician, you're asking me to understand about human nature, which is our belief that diversity and freedom are fundamental to maintaining and keeping open all of our options, not just for ourselves, for ourselves, but for the next million years. And the only way we're going to be here in a way that's, you know, in a way that's, that's good in the next thousand years, in the next hundred years. I say a hundred because I really am frightened that we may not last. Um, we've eliminated so many timelines already that you know we can't talk about millions anymore because we can't imagine it. And that's what the machines, they make it look like they can contemplate every possibility, but they're creating the reality as they, based on the information they receive. And the great thing about the human brain is that we're able to create things that no longer, that don't actually exist yet. And the machine can do that as well. It's not, you know, it's not at all disputed. The way you debate all these things with the people that, that rely on the visual or over the thinking, over the, over the brain, over the abstract, is by saying that, let's try to do it what it is. And one way to do it is, is, again, by saying, let's put into place exactly what you want. Surveillance on a camera on every single home. Take it to this extreme. And then see what the person says. 
do you really want to have a department of police officers that knows that it can take any action it wants without having any checks and balances? Um, even if it means that we get to catch more criminals, because you're not going to catch all of them. Even with technology, it won't happen. So what you're really doing is providing a false sense of security in exchange for the elimination of human possibility. And ultimately, the idea again is to maintain that signal, is to get that signal stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what we do it by relying on outliers. And it's the damn tragedy that this is, that this happened because it's not an outlier to you. It's an outlier only in the abstract, which is why you have a more convincing argument today. You do not have a convincing argument 100 years from now if we do what you want us to do. You do not have a convincing or even a viable argument a thousand years from now if we do what you want us to do, which is to forsake what is fundamental and good and different about human beings versus something that just absorbs data, whatever data it sees, and tries to make sense of it. What makes us different are all these makes life worth living, are all these different timelines and trying to increase those timelines and those possibilities as much as we possibly can, which necessitates a checks and balances system across the board without having Im extreme imbalances, especially with, in relation to the executive branch. What we need to do now is to get the physical into a system where we prioritize things that are necessary food, shelter, healthcare, and how to pay for it in ways that are sustainable. But ultimately, what you're asking me to do by relying on what you're doing, ma'am, is really what you're really doing here, is when you argue that had we had tougher immigration restrictions, you know, your son would still be alive today. That's what the President of the United States argued when he, in one of his speeches in around 2016 or, or 2017, standing in He said, he actually pointed out, he used the visual over the, over the abstract, and he said, had we had tougher immigration, had we had, we had a wall, uh, we would, that person's son would still be alive today. And people clapped. The way you respond, and nobody at any point in time, and there must have been somebody, but nobody, it wasn't televised, therefore that box that we, where the, wasn't able to pick up on the signal. What somebody should have said again is, this is a cheap stunt that minimizes human potential in the long run. And even in the short run, creates an imbalance between the different branches by, by trying to pick something and not addressing its root cause. And fundamentally, the problem with human beings is that our nature tends to deal with what's in front of us not, not what, and what we can see, not all these unknown possibilities that allow us to have a life worth living and a life where we can maximize the meaning of our existence. Fundamentally, what you're doing when you rely on the visual, when you rely on these instances and put them in, in, the, in, the, in the box, when you feed them into the box and you try to manipulate the signal, fundamentally what you, in, in ways that I'm sure, in ways that use tragedies to deal not with a long-term solution, which requires the addressing of a root cause, what you're doing is you're actually making it harder for human beings to exist in a meaningful way because you're not dealing with the root cause, you're dealing with something that ultimately will never address the root cause. If we fix this problem, it'll happen again, even if we do build a wall. It may be somebody else, but it will happen again. What we need to do is think bigger. We need to have a situation where we understand that what happened is, is not just because we didn't have a wall, but because we had you know, a, a situation where millions of different factors, some we know about, some we don't know about, contributed to this instance happening. It could be economic, it could be the failure to invest properly in neighboring countries, it could be a failure of the police systems in different countries being working together. It could be just, it could be a million different things that led to this instance. If you build a wall, what you're really doing is you're foreclosing on these opportunities, on these timelines that we, what would exist based on cooperation, not, not just safe cooperation, but reasonable and reasoned cooperation. And what you're doing, what you're asking us to do when you present this image in front of us, out of all the other images you could have shown, shown and, and presented, what you're asking us to do is to foreclose on the possibility of human nature. And that is not something we are willing to do. It is not, a, not an outcome we want to give our grandchildren. It is not an outcome, that is an outcome that guarantees the machines will replace us in ways that eliminate, not just today, not just 10 years from now, but forever. Because every time we do something that doesn't address a root cause in ways that understands, in ways that recognize 
that everything is done as part of an ecosystem with multiple factors, not just one. So when you say that we should have built a wall to keep an, immigrant, an illegal immigrant out, and that would have saved this woman's, you know, this, this woman's child's life, you are only true in a very limited sense. What you're really asking us to do is, to do is, is not to deal with the root cause. You haven't had a solution at all to the root cause of human violence in general. And what you're really doing is you're simply, and this has been the problem with human nature, this is why we keep repeating history, you always deal with what's in front of us. You don't try to go back and realize that what, what got us to this point is if the, if the perpetrator, if the, if the murderer is 21 years old, what happened, who happened over 21 years of failures, most of which we're not going to be able to find, even if we're able to go back and record every instance and surveil every instance. What we need to do is address the root causes so we're not constantly looking back. We're actually not looking back. We're not constantly in a position where we're dealing with what's in front of us without looking back. And if we keep doing that, we're going to repeat history because we haven't been able to shift our, the images that go into our minds, into our brain, into a long-term view that addresses what's behind us and what's ahead of us. And what is going to happen is the rise of the And that's what you're really advocating for to talk about.